Hi, welcome back. And uh, in this episode, we are actually going to be looking at uh, the conquering of uh, the Agakoyo people through the eyes of a white woman. And actually, uh, right at the start of the book, uh, with the prehistoric people, uh, the Akikuyu of British East Africa, um, there is, there's a section by Skoretsby. I don't know if that's how you say this name. Uh, uh, Skoresby uh, Rutledge, who is the husband of the woman whose uh, eyes we're going to look at what my tribe was like. And he gives an introduction um, in the preface and he talks about how he has uh, entrenched himself uh, before uh, he brings he brings his wife and you know he talks about uh, bringing um, uh, so, so he speaks of the uh, the roads the um, uh, how um, the um, the Gekoyo are being tamed um, and he talks about the road and how the Agekoyo view uh, the roads uh, so he says um, that the Agekoyo share with the majority of the native races an intense dislike to the coming of the road. Of course they do. Of course they do. Because don't forget what happened uh, before this is that Europeans and the uh, uh, Arab uh, henchmen and some Africans are uh, basically the makeup of the slave raiders. So they've endured, Africans by this point have endured years, actually centuries of being raided by slave traders. And so to them, Rhodes is literally bringing the enemy to your village. And so the Akikuyu share with the majority of uh, native races an intense dislike of coming of the road. So it's not that they, they were old fashioned when it comes to viewing roads, it's because they knew roads made it very easy for their villages to be raided by slave traders. So um, Skoresby uh, notes that uh, the intense dislike to the coming of the road being shrewd enough to see that all its, its presence conveys and never themselves make a visible truck for obvious reasons. These are people who have learned that their lives are in constant danger because Europeans are thirsty for Africans. They are thirsty for the labor, which uh, basically, and, and therefore they, they protect their villages by not creating any roads. And, um, um, and then he carries on to note that they're experts in making roads. Like, what do these people think of Africans? That they, they, they can actually make a road. Yeah, they can cut some bushes and create a truck. Uh, incredible. So he notes how he interjects himself. He says, as part of the work thus bringing the country under the control, a new station was formed at Nyeri, some 30 miles uh, northward of Fort Hall. I was present at the selection of the site and obtained and entrenched a small plot of ground in the neighborhood. Think about that. Literally, this foreigner has turned up. They have claimed a piece of land and they have actually built Think if anybody were to do this anywhere in Europe or in America. But this is what they do. This is what they have done. The buildings I put up were rough stone room of photo, uh, for photographic work and uh, what are known as bandas or large erections resembling buns with thatched roofs uh, and open sides underneath which tents can be pitched and goods stored. As I looked northward from my door, there was nothing but wilderness between me and Abyssinia. If you don't know what Abyssinia is, Abyssinia is what is modern day known as Ethiopia. But, uh, and I'll do a whole thing about Abyssinia because Abyssinia was a very uh, powerful nation. Uh, lions were not infrequent visitors and rhinoceroses abound. Yeah, because Europeans by this point were only interested in slaves, but they, they're pretty much the animals. Because this is the first thing that they do when they arrive anywhere is destroy all forest habitat and destroy all the animals. And at this point, there's loads of animals. And later on, uh, uh, the book actually talks about Roosevelt, uh, when Roosevelt visits with his 19 year old son and how they just go wild in shooting everything that is standing and I don't understand. I don't understand that mentality of just killing, 
killing, killing, killing. I don't know what it is about these people that just want to kill. Uh, so he continues, uh, I once counted as many as 30 lions having been killed to my uh, own knowledge within a radius of a mile uh, of a point near my fixed camp. Using this little homestead as a depot and availing myself to Mr. Hines' permission and advice, I traveled about the country shooting, <laughs> yeah, killing, uh, photographing, collecting, and taking notes. And uh, not only, uh, never on any occasion had any serious trouble with the natives, but on the contrary, became great friends with various influential men over a wide extent of the country. See, this is what they do. They go and befriend influential men. They give them gifts. They sweet talk them. And this is how they infiltrate a country. Uh, in particular, the younger and only brother of one of the principal chiefs became my inseparable companion. He was uh, an especially bright, attractive lad of about 17, widely known and university popular. And by him, I was chaperoned um, into the Kikoyu society. Oh my God. You know what? And this hasn't changed because I'm thinking about currently what's happening in Kenya. Uh, because in Kenya, currently, there is uh, the American ambassador by the name of Meg Whitman. She's done exactly the same. She has entrenched herself in the parliament. And th this the same has happened in Uganda. Americans have done the same in Uganda. They write the bills for parliament and so on and so forth. So this is a practice that has been done and very successfully for hundreds and hundreds of years. Where he could not introduce me, as in the case of certain rights, his influence was such that I always found myself committed to the care of an influential sponsor. You notice the way he keeps talking about influential sponsor. Mm. This is the tactic that they have used for centuries. Uh, much information regarding native customs was gathered from my various retainers during long rides and shooting expeditions about the country. Where the conversation naturally turned onto objects around us, but um, the most fruitful season was in the evening. When I made it a, a practice to have a big fire in front of my tent and everyone was welcome. See, he is grooming them. That's exactly what he's doing. He's lighting a big fire um, because obviously people, people uh, don't do that uh, uh, at this point. Uh, in Kenya, the Agikoyo people don't do that. So he's having a bonfire and he's inviting people. He's essentially grooming them. They sat around it uh, in order of social consideration, talking amongst themselves. I uh, presently joined uh, the conversation, perhaps asking a question, and so induced one man to give an explanation, which would be corrected and amplified by the others. So this is very cunning. He's putting out a question and he gets the natives to discuss and therefore and they don't actually know what's going to happen to them they don't actually know that in not too long from the arrival of the europeans in about maybe 10 years or so that the land that they call home right now is going to be gone they are going to be turned into virtual slaves in the country uh, that they live in by the people they are befriending in this ma man manner, I also got in touch with local gossip and learned what was going on in the neighborhood, festivals, dances, markets, and like. And this knowledge gathering is so pivotal to colonization because one of the things that, that the, the British did when they, um, when they entrenched themselves was they actually outlawed dancing. They outlawed dancing so because it was such a huge pastime is where all the Gekoyu gathered and uh, in between harvest, they uh, held their dance festivals. And this would have been an opportunity for them to discuss any issues that may, be, may pose a threat to the British occupation. And so he, these guys, Koretsby, uh, he is gathering all this information about the natives so that they know exactly how they're going to go about colonizing them. Invitations will be given and expeditions, uh, expeditions made to be present. 
and this in their uh, in their turn opened out fresh fields and new pastures. Wow. And this is where the story gets interesting. Going to England for a while in 1904, uh, I again returned this time with a wife. And on uh, presenting my native friends to her, she found them so interesting that she devoted herself to gathering information in directions that I had passed over. So he has brought his wife now, the woman whose eyes we're going to use to see um, my tribe. And how basically they entrench themselves even deeper into uh, into the colonization of the Agikoyo people. Um, and so he continues to talk about the methods of collecting information were much the same during the later visit as those already described. But in addition, possible uh, for my wife to visit among the huts and thus come in contact with the women and the domestic life. So the woman plays a very good role in filtrating women and the domestic life. Wow. My God. Now I'm looking back at this and I'm just thinking about what all this means. So this man, Skoretsby, and his wife, Catherine, they have essentially infiltrated my tribe and the resulting outcome will culminate some years later, some 60 years later, with the whole of my tribe being taken to extermination camps and concentration camps and detention centers with the intention of wiping all them out. It's so sobering to actually look at just how calm and calculated these people um, essentially, cunningly infiltrate a people with the intention of destroying them. Please subscribe and let's find out more about my tribe, the Agikoyo people.